computer for recording. Okay, the big theme for week seven, and welcome again to this ever innovating and changing course. This the big theme for this week. I want you to think about it. it it's about IP protection, but also, and this will become evident when we go through the presentations. I want you to think about it. If you want to know about best practice and how to manage the suppliers and protect your IP and do everything, who who would be, what would be a company in the world that you think would have the best practice in the world? Who, who, who would you go to? If you had a magic wand, you could go to any company and find out from them and they'll tell you. Come on. If you want to find out the best practice for managing suppliers, protecting IP risk, who would you go and see that has the best practice? Alibaba. Um, well, we're talking about we're talking about multinational sourcing and managing a supply chain. Okay, so Alibaba may not be expert on that, but that's a good start. Okay, Alibaba, that's a marketplace, right? That's a marketplace, so they don't have supply chain, but they may know about supply chain. So possibly you could learn from them. Who else could you learn from? Apple. But, uh, who said Apple? I did. Okay. So, uh, and why did you say Apple? Uh, because they are quite uh, famous, uh, known as, you know, a company very sensitive with patent or copyrights, that kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And anyone else? Another, another company. So we've got Apple, Alibaba. We've got another company. Come on, there's hundreds of um, thousands. Hello, Professor. Yes. Yes, I'm going to go for the Qualcomm, the one that's uh, produced the Snap, uh, Snapdragon. It's like the one, uh, the, the chip that's inside your, your phone. I'm going to go for that company. I love Qualcomm. Okay, so you all know Qualcomm because of the Snapdragon that goes inside your Android phones. But interesting. Absolutely, they have a supply chain, a US company, but uh, they run a supply chain. So you can learn a lot from them because they are sourcing in their supply chain, they are managing quite high tech stuff that would be protected under IP. Anyone else? Any other company? Come on, every one of you must have a company in mind. So I'm asking every one of you to write in the chat room a name of a company you have in mind now. You have 10 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Come on, some of you are very slow here. We've got to wake up. We're just starting this class. In three hours' time, you'll all be asleep if we're, we're starting at this level of energy. We need more energy, don't we? Okay. All right. So we've got HP, we've got Lenovo, we've got Honda, Samsung, eBay, Samsung. Okay. So if you had a magic wand, you could actually go to these companies. You can learn all about them. They'll tell you everything, what you should do, what you shouldn't do, the do's and don'ts, right? But the reality is you'll never get access to these companies. You'll never find out. Why would they want to tell you? That's their secret source. And what if they made a mistake? They learn from their mistakes over the years, right? Do you think they're going to tell you the mistakes they make? I want you to show, uh, put your hand up if you think, yes, they will share with you the mistakes they make. Put your thumb up if you think they won't. Come on, interactive tonight. 
Jenny, you're noting this interaction from the students, aren't you? Good, thank you. Yes. All right, good. Okay, thumb up. No, they won't. Okay, so if they're not going to, what do you think? Do you learn more from good practice or mistakes that people make? Mistakes. mistakes. You learn a lot faster from mistakes, mistakes because you say, okay, all right, that doesn't work. I better not do that, okay? Oh, this seems to be work. I'll try that, all right? So you've got to learn the negative and the positive, right? So you might learn the good practice because they want to tell you all the good things about themselves, but they're not going to tell you the bad things. All right. No one wants to tell you the things they did wrong. Am I right? All right. So you're not going to learn much from these companies. You put down all these companies. Yeah, they'll tell you all the good things, but they won't tell you the mistakes. So who do you think you could go to to find out about the mistakes? Who do you think you can learn from? Hello, Edgar? Startups. Startups, Start yes. You can learn from startups about their mistakes. You can learn from them how they have tried to manage a supply chain and failed. It's very hard for startups to, it's very hard for them to hide mistakes that they have made. You hear what I'm saying here, okay? All right? So this is why tonight we've got two groups presenting. Each of them are presenting on six startups. Am I right? Yeah. And so they're going to present to you about, well, what went right, what went wrong in managing the supply chain. Not all of these six startups for each group have, been successful a lot of them have failed why did they fail so i want you to pay attention tonight the reason why we're looking at startups is because we get to have a more transparent observation of things that can go wrong are you here are you with me Yes. Sir. Right. So this is this is why we're here in week seven. Okay. And this is why we're looking at startups. Because we learn more from them when things go wrong. Because if something goes wrong in Apple, they can cover it up. They got lots of resources. One department fails at doing something, then it gets subsidized by something else. And you never know. But a startup, something goes wrong, the startup can fail overnight. You with me here, okay? So this is why we are doing this in week seven. And at the same time, we're going to make you more aware of the sensitivities associated with protecting IP. Because if we're looking at startups, hardware startups or IOT startups, that's Internet of Things startups, then protection of the IP is critical, very critical, because that's the secret source. And this is why we're doing what we're doing tonight. The why is very important. And that's why I'm excited about this because we, you know, we've just finished looking at a three circle control framework. We've got startups, we've got a midterm break, then a little quiz, and then we look at the multinationals. Ah, wow. This course just it gets more exciting every week. I can't wait to uh, get into tonight. So the big question tonight is, what is the best sequence of covering everything tonight? Well, actually, I want to cover everything first off, uh, but I will give the opportunity for the groups to present first because you've been working very, very hard to get ready. And it's, it's very hard to concentrate on my lecture when, you know, you're in the mindset, I've got to present, you know, I've got to focus and be on my game when I'm presenting. So I will ask, we've got two groups presenting tonight. Am I right? I hope they're here. Yes. And, am I in the right class? <laughs> Okay. Yes. All right. All right. This is great. 
Okay, you're all doing very, very well. And so we've got our first, uh, so that's the theme. And so when the presenters, when they present, uh, what's important is that you keep this in mind that, oh, this is not, we're not going from supply chain to startup. We're actually looking at startups to understand more about, well, what can go wrong? Okay, what can go wrong in managing the supply chain? And that's why we are looking at what we're looking at. All right, so I'm just looking at the groups. I haven't shared my screen, so I'm just looking at the group membership. We have, uh, we have group five. Hands up for group five. Group five and group four discovery. Okay, is group four discovery ready? Yes, we are. Jimbe Hala means, are you ready? Okay, ready. Huh? And G5, uh, do we have everyone in G5 with us tonight? Joyce, Jessica, Muchin, Nikal, and Sanzana. Are you all here with us tonight? Hello. Uh, one. Yeah. Yeah. You're waiting Nico, for. Yeah, Nico uh, met a uh, medical issues that maybe he will come back at uh, eight, around eight to eight eight thirty, like that. Okay, that's fine. Okay, well, um, and G four, are you ready? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So what we'll do, we'll go with group four, and then I will go to. Uh, then we'll do the. Uh, the review and and I'll keep going until group five is ready. Okay, are we, are we okay with that? Yep. Okay, all right. Mm. Shall I share the screen now? Yes, you can, yes. Okay, sharing the screen. And just before you begin, um, we just wanna make sure that we And shall I start? Uh, no, not yet. Uh, let let me introduce you first. In the right hand corner, we have we have uh, Edgar. Is that right? We have Zihan and yes. Chi Young and Selbia Idris. Is that right? Idris, is that correct? Wonderful, wonderful. Okay. All right. So uh, I've just explained to everyone the reason why we're looking at startups. Uh, you have uh, 12 minutes and question time and I wish you all the best. And class, uh, pay attention and always be ready to ask questions. Give him a hand. Come on, let's get some energy in this room. Okay, take it away, group. Okay. Uh, hello, guys. The topic of our presentation is the global supply chain challenge of the IoT startups. And uh, I'm Yang Yichen. Yeah. First of all, our group would like to show you the basic information about the IoT. Please, yeah. The full name of IoT is the Internet of Things, which has been considered as the third digital revolution nowadays. It's a system of uh, interrelated uh, internet connected objects that are able to collect and transfer data over a wireless network without human intervention. IoT can inspire the companies by increasing revenue, reducing operating costs, and improving efficiency, which are the reason why IoT plays such an important role in the society. Please next. On the other hand, the startups have their own character, uh, characteristics. Normally, the startups will focus on the innovation in order to differentiate themselves from the competitors to gain market advantage. However, it's unavailable that their innovation has a higher risk due to the uncertainty of the market. The product is brand new to the world, and it's hard to know the response of the customer. The third feature is that most startups have the final problem, financial problem. Since most startups are capable of developing software and firmware, the feature of IoT is suitable for the startups. 
However, struggling to manage the hardware production is still a problem to the startup's business. Our team chose six capital IoT startups to analyze the challenge they face in producing the product, and all the startups got their funding from the funding rising sets. They are Goki, Jarvis, Flops, Narrowleaf, Bagel Lab, and AirButton. Then let's pass to my teammate Han for the detailed discussion. Thank you, Yichen, for the brief introduction on what are the IOTs. And now let's talk about what are the major challenges that are faced by these startups. Next, please. So as you can see from the video here, based on Professor Neil's interviews video, we found that GoKey was a project post in 2014. And its main product was a combo battery device, which functioned like a power bank, and that can go easily to your key ring. But at the same time, it has the smart features like you can use it as a remote to control your phone for taking a selfie and also ring your phone. And this project raised around 1.2 million US dollars from Indiegogo. The next, the second startup is called Jawish, which is also founded in 2014, and its main product was the Intelligent Helmet, which is integrating an intelligent system like Siri into the helmets. And this project raised around $1 million from both Indiegogo and Kickstarter's platform. Nice, please. So one of the main challenges that Goki was facing it was the cultural differences. So it was spoken by Doris, which is the CEO of the Goki, and he mentioned that by having an effective communication and collaboration with the Chinese teams and the manufacturers was an issue due to the differences in the languages being spoken and also the cultures. And it was hard for Goki to work with the right Chinese manufacturers and teams to making sure that the things and the products that they are going to produce are exactly by the design. And this has led to another challenges, which is under the manufacturing process, which is specifically led to, which is specifically referring to overseeing the whole flow of the manufacturing process. And this is meaning they are spending more time, money, and efforts in overseeing and, mo and monitoring the whole flow of to, to make sure the products are getting right. And the next challenges, which is the building up the distribution networks, it was another challenge mentioned in the video as well. So as Goki is a startup and they are planning to enter into different markets, thus building up an effective relationship with the local distributors from different countries was posing a challenge to them. And we can see because of these challenges mentioned in the video, Goki was finally resulting in shorter funds, which directly led them into a serious supply chain problem, the under delivery situation. Goki was not able to cover the cost of getting the manufacturer to produce the products that they want, and no manufacturer in China wants to produce for them. That's, this leads to the situation that they could not deliver the products to, to the backers and the buyers. Well, in contrast, Jarvis was facing a different type of challenges. As mentioned in the video, Jarvis is a company that's focusing on developing the intelligence system and the integrators into the helmets. So due to the complexity of the system and also the software development, research was one of the major challenges that Jarvis has encountered. Then moving on to the next challenge that Jarvis had encountered, which is the demand from the consumers. So I, as also mentioned in the video, the consumers want to get some edge technology, like the heads up display, rather than just something to, rather than the things like volume control. They want to see the things inside the helmet. So this is posing another type of challenges that uh, for, for Jarvis constantly to improve their softwares and also integrate it in with, the, with the hardware, which is the helmet. Next, please. So now, after I explained and after I elaborate what are the challenges that are faced by Jawish and also Goki, guys, which one of the company currently still operating and which one has failed? You have 10, 10 seconds to put your answer into the chat box. And it comes now. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Bang. So the answer is Jarvis. Goki has failed. And now I'm going to pass to Agia for, the, for elaborating the next two startups. Thank you very much, um, Zian. All right, um, good evening, everyone. My name is Agia. Now I'm going to illustrate some of the supply chain challenges by looking at these two startups, Bagelapes and AirButton. Quick introduction to these two startups. Firstly, Bagelapes is a Korean startup company in which they develop a measuring device retail at around $79 a piece. This device help, help people to measure and send the measurement to the mobile apps, which can be organized and analyzed. 
They also utilizes start uh, Kickstarter campaign in 2006 to fund the pro uh, to fund to fund uh, to fund the production in which they successfully gather around 1.3 million dollars um, for the campaign. Air button, in the other hand, developed NFC smart um, button price uh, smart button price around 16 dollars that can be stick to the smartphone, allowing the user to access to more than 30 function in the smartphone with a single press of the button. Like Bagel Lab, they also had a successful campaign Kickstarter, which gathered around 22,000 US dollar in November 2015. Now, moving to the challenges faced by these two startups, as we can see, both companies encounter manufacturing process challenges. Bagel Lab, for example, stated that they experienced a delay of production due to damage to the molding equipment. It is worth mentioning that in this Bagel, uh, Bagel Lab, they are working, uh, they encounter this manufacturing challenge challenges despite working alongside an established partner company in Korea that is known to produce Samsung product. Air Button, on the other hand, stated that it is difficult to find the right factory in mainland China to manufacture the product exactly what the Air Button team had designed. As a matter of fact, Air Button rely mostly on luck and recommendation from friends in selecting their factories. This upstream challenge is further amplified uh, by the difficulty in coordinating and communicating product design with the factory in mainland China. Air Button, in addition, also quite wary about the partner factories imitating their product, uh, their product behind their back. This is, of course, a huge challenge for a startup company like Air Button, which relies on product innovation and product quality to create a differentiator in the market and make the consumer satisfied and happy. Bagel Lab, in the other hand, mostly encounter a more downstream challenges such as selecting partner company to distribute the large number of product that the baker had ordered from the Kickstarter on time. That's the key, on time, how to deliver on time. Finding the right channels of product distribution is just extremely important for Bagel Labs as they aim to expand their consumer and market beyond Korea and the US. Aside from, the, aside, aside from partnering with the distributor, they also aim to be more aggressive in product marketing beyond the existing market. And now we move on to the quiz again. Which of these startup still operate today? You have 10 more seconds. You can use the chat. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. The answer is actually both of these companies still survive today. As a matter of fact, they're developing quite nicely. They have a few variation in their in their products, and you can actually find their products in Amazon nowadays. So now I'm going to pass the floor to Sabia to explain about the two last um, startup. Hello, everyone. The last two startup companies to be discussed in these presentations are Blocks and Nanoleaf. Blocks is a Taiwan-based startup company that developed a modular smartwatch. The strap of the watch is made of several electronic modules, each with its own functions. In 2015, Blocks was managed to gather about a USD 1.6 million from the Kickstarter campaign for this project. Uh, another startup company is a Canada-based company called Nanoleaf. Nanoleaf launched its first product, high-efficiency LED light bulbs, on Kickstarter in 2014 and received around USD 200,000 from the site. Over the years, Nanoleaf develops a few more smart lighting products. Next slide, please. Both of these startup companies face challenges in the man manufacturing process and R&D, but under a different circumstance. Blocks experience a production delay resulting in difficulties to deliver the products to the project backers and to the market. On the other hand, Nanoleaf major challenges are managing distribution channels as well as managing and forecasting demand. Nanoleaf excellently identified its main target markets. However, the company is still learning to understand its distribution channels. This leads to challenges in the manufacturing process because Nanoleaf is heavily dependent on the demand to drive its production scale. Therefore, it is difficult to plan for mass production and rolling out into stores. For example, the Nanoleaf Aurora Rhythm, as shown in the video, took 10 months from the ideation to mass production. In R&D, Blocks was struggled to get more developers involved in the production and to ensure the product meets the high quality expectations. For Nanoleaf, the most difficult hurdle is to come out with a new innovative product. 
one of the Nanoleafs co-founding partners ran a factory in his previous career. Therefore, it is not a problem for Nanoleaf to find the right manufacturing partners. Other supply chain challenges faced by blocks are customers' expansion, cultural fit, and IP protections. Blocks' marketing approach is via social media, and blocks tried hard to push people to adopt to their technology. The modular smartwatch developed by Blocks is patented. The company has separated its production process to protect the IP in which the firmware, software, and assembling process were in Taiwan and the hardware manufacturing process in Sichuan, China. Unfortunately, Blocks ended its modular smartwatch project and entered liquidation in August 2019. Blocks required additional capital for a new manufacturing partner and R&D after losing its main manufacturing and software partners at the end of 2016. This situation also caused the manufactured smartwatch did not meet high quality expectations. Okay, let's have the last quiz for these presentations. From my presentation, which of these startup still operating today? One, two, three. You can use the chat belt. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Na, 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 na. The answer is only Nanoleaf is still operating today. I'll pass to Yi Cheng to summarize our presentation. Okay. It's come to the big takeaways. Because of the popularization of personal terminal, IoT business will survive and have a great future. But they still face some challenges now. We try to rank those challenges. It seems obvious that most, the most common challenge that the startups encountered is the manufacturing process, followed by the distribution and the research and development. The challenge in manufacturing process are also quite variable among different startups. For example, Air Button has a problem about the right design where GoKey are suffering long lead time. Please next. In conclusion, sufficient funding and patience seem to be inadequate to ensure a successful production. The startups need to make sure that uh, they have a good understanding of the supply chain management, which is a guarantee to operate uh, successfully. Okay, uh, thank you for listening. Next part is Q&A. Any question? Yes, that concludes our presentation. Okay, questions, please. You can write the question in the chat room, but we do expect you to ask questions. Can you show that last diagram again that, that summarizes the startups? So stop. Okay. So which of these do you think was the major problem? Yes. You got, um, you got research and development. Is that um, how how is that a problem? Research and development problem is more on the um, the startup trying to de um, to develop their software and the firmware in order to in order to improve their product. Yeah, which one? <laughs> Blocks would be an ideal uh, example of that you said because they lost their partner. Like they lost their research and development partner, or they lost their manufacturing partner. They lost their um, manufacturing partner. So that didn't affect the research and development, or did it? But yeah, for them, um, one of because this is the thing. Um, they are the one thing that we, the one, the, the one thing that we found that is that um, most of these startup actually stated. Um, these challenges such as research of development, um, consumer expansion, marketing, but they, they are not thinking about um, what kind of challenges that we're going to face in manufacturing. So they kind of skip that, 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 um, that part where they actually have to take care of the operation and the manufacturing part. But instead, they're already thinking about research and development, perhaps because that's what, that is what they are good at. So this is one of the this is one of the um, weaknesses of this startup is that they actually they haven't actually thought about this um, manufacturing processes how they are going to tackle this um, 
manufacturing process, how they're going to find a partner, and how they're going to manage their partner. Oh, I understand that, but uh, when you presented, the uh, who, who presented on blocks? Uh, it's me. Yeah, Idris, you said that part of their failure was due to the production design delay and lost partners. Yes. Okay, so uh, where is that represented on this table? Both the manufacturing process and uh, research and development because the blocks, the ideas is good, but they are too ambitious. They create different modules with different uh, functions. But the thing is sometimes the, the hardware did not match with it. Uh, based on my research, the hardware sometimes did not fit with the software and firmware. And uh, there's a mismatch uh, between this. Yeah, I think you need to make the uh, table clearer because you've got manufacturing process, but do you see that different from the items underneath? Like coordination, uh, if you lost a partner, that doesn't go under R&D. Um, that doesn't go on the manufacturing process. Like that's, you know, that should but, have but a, have that should, a, should be a different line, okay, yeah. right? They have uh, issues in delay of production. So that's when it goes under manufacturing process. I understand that, yeah. You mm -hmm. just need to be more specific on that. I think that was important to say that. Um, but the fact that you did say lost partners, so that and in some ways that's another line item too. How did they lose a partner? Like the partner just wasn't interested in continuing. Maybe they had a run in. We um, don't. You don't know, right? Uh, based on uh, the websites that we can trust, it says that the the software partners was acquired by Google. Ah, okay. So now you say software partner. So now we're yes. a little bit more specific in the supply chain. You should have mentioned that, and that should be clearer in the table because we're dealing with IOTs then the whole idea of IOT you're combining firmware software hardware and then you're trying to market it all but you're trying to combine it all because no one supply no one supplier is able to supply all of these items you have you've got to bring them all together right and that's part of the complexity of of the IoT supply chain, and that's something you could have made a little bit more clearer. Um, any uh, questions from the class, please? Hello? It's early class. Everyone should be question. awake at this time. I have a question. Yes. Uh, so here it shows that Jarvish has the least challenges face as opposed to all the other startups mm. but in the end it still failed so why do you think that happened um sorry can, can we go back to a few slides it was what, what, the question was which one of the companies still operating and uh, we said jawish is still operating while goki has failed yeah oh. correct oh sorry yep. mm. my mistake Okay, let's go back to the table. So just remind the class, which one of these have failed? So we have um, GoKey, Blocks, and just GoKey and Blocks have failed, correct? The one so, in red, GoKey and Blocks, the one in red. Sorry. Yeah, all right. Uh, next question. Okay, uh, I think in your summary, you could make a little bit clearer about what um, bagels, they had damage of molding equipment, is it? That was interesting. Yes, sir. Um, we read it in the Kickstarter page. Um, wow. One, one of the delay, when they actually update their backers, they say that um, one of the delay is because the molding equipment itself is damaged. And this is quite funny because um, one of the, one of the founders was actually an engineer in Samsung. 
So mm. he already have some connection with a factory that produced Samsung. So they actually yeah. the factory and the startup itself is already very close. Wow. But still, problem exists. You know, so um, we cannot really, even when you know the factories itself, um, manufacturing problem will persist. It's amazing, isn't it? Okay, so in summary, you know, GoKey, they their major supply chain challenge uh, failing was more. There was more cost in manufacturing than that they realized. That was the main thing for that, correct? Yes, sir. So basically, the thing is that was the um, main one. Yeah, the, the, that's the main one. And GoKey yeah. was lack of experiences in getting manufacturer in China, so they found right. the wrong they, they found the wrong manufacturer. Yes, and now Jarvis, they had challenges because of complexity, but they ended up uh, getting through that. So I think that's an amazing story in itself because their product is really complex. I think one of the reasons is Jarvis was being founded by one of the division of X Foxconn uh, Advanced oh. Technology Design Team. So they do have the relationship with the Foxconn. Okay, maybe. And they Mm, yeah. So you need to make a note of that. It, in some ways, uh, we should have a new line item under manufacturing about, you know, relationship with key partners. And so that became a big positive. That's a big positive for Jarvis, but it was a big negative for blocks. You see what I mean, group? How, you hear me? All right. So... Yes. And we're going to talk about this later, that what you're going to learn is that one, one way that IOTs can deal with their dependence on the supply chain, because they do depend on the supply chain, is how they, how they manage their relationship with the suppliers. Do they have an equity? Do they have a joint venture? Or do they just do a contracting partnership? And there are different ways that you can manage that relationship. And that's all part of the supply chain management because you ask how you set up that relationship or manage that relationship impacts on the protection of the IP and the risk and uh, blocks got it wrong, but Jarvish got it right. So you see what I mean? Class, this is what we're learning. We're learning because of the mistakes that these companies are making here. Okay, so just make a note of that and keep that in mind for when we uh, talk about uh, more startups later this evening. Okay, very good. Very good group. Uh, and I, class, we need a little bit more energy in your questions here. Okay. <laughs> Come on. All right. Okay, we got, uh, and Nicole has arrived, but G5, does that mean you're ready, is it? Yes. Is it? All right, so are you, are you ready with energy or are you just ready? Yes. What does that mean? Are you just ready or ready with <laughs> energy? Oh, of course, with energy, okay. <laughs> energy, exactly. Energy so is we're ready to go, so we are. Hi, Nicole. You, you made it. Oh, Everything good? Amazing, okay. All right. Just uh, so we've got... Uh, Hello, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, and we... G5, we have Joyce, Jessica, uh, Muchin, Nicole, and Sanzana. Is that right? Yes, sir. Yes. All right, Sanzana, uh, where's Muchin? Yeah, got you. Uh, Jessica, Jessica, and Joyce. Yes, sir. And Nicole, that's wonderful, wonderful. Nicole, is your connection okay? Yes, sir. All good. All good. Okay. All right. So we have our second group. Now, class, I want you to start, start to write down, start thinking about, you know, what's going on here. Like summary of the last presentation is that 
I, you know, my sense from the, those last six that were presented was, you know, um, how they manage their partnership with the factory is really, really critical. Uh, the fact that bagel labs had damaged molding equipment, but they still survived anyway. So, uh, because they had a very good product. Uh, right, Edgar? Edgar? Hello. Okay. Um, then there was others that had production delay because of lost partners, pro problem in manufacturing. Wow. All these problems come out that we really haven't talked about before. So we want to talk about these tonight. So uh, group, are you ready with energy? And you're, you're going to present to us uh, six more, uh, six more IoT startups. Is that right? Yes, sir. That's six? Okay. Yes. And uh, looking forward to your presentation. Uh, you can begin when you're ready. Uh, just before we begin, I have provided a Kahoot pin. So after our presentation, maybe we'll have a Kahoot session at the you end. Have, you have a Kahoot. Wow. Yeah. Okay. That's okay. I'm getting better at Kahoot now. That's good. Okay. Uh, is the class ready for the presentation? A ready meaning ready with questions. You should be a little bit more ready now that you've gone through one presentation. We know what we're looking for. We're looking, we've got the magnifying glass on these IoT startups about what caused problems to occur okay and then we learn from that and that's how we become better supply chain managers remember this course is not international marketing or something else or management it's supply chain management okay so uh g5 uh when you're ready Good evening, everyone. I'm Sanzana, and I have Jessica Nikhil, Muchen, Joyce with me to present on innovation and the rise of IoT startups. Next slide, please. So basically, our presentation is divided into three parts. Next slide. So what is IoT? Well, as you know, IoT refers to the Internet of Things, which describes the network of physical objects or things that are embedded with sensors, software, and other technologies for connecting and exchanging data with other devices and systems over the internet. Next slide, please. Moving on, the six IoT startups we will be talking about are Soundbrenner Limited, Shenzhen BB Fly Electronics Limited, Sonic Dutch Co. Limited, Yujin Attercube, Hangzhou Chic Intelligent Technology Co. Limited, now, it is very interesting on how all of these companies are IoT startups, yet have completely different products from each other. For an example, Soundbrenner is a variable device for musicians produced by Soundbrenner Limited, which is based in Hong Kong and started with Indiegogo. Next, we have Shenzhen BB Fly Electronics Limited. The company is based in Shenzhen that produces anti-snoring device. The company established in 2015 as Indiegogo Sonic Dutch Limited, started as Kickstarter in 2015 and is based in South Korea that produces a coffee brewing machine. Eugene was founded in 2015 in Taiwan as Indiegogo with the idea of selling muscle mass massaging device. And uh, we have uh, Atocube that was founded in 2001 in Korea, and it produces educational game that, uh, that, that is building blocks for children. Lastly, we have Hangzhou Chief Intelligent Technology Co. Limited that started in the year 2013 as Kickstarter in Hangzhou producing Hoover Boats. Although some of them started either as Indiegogo or Kickstarter, however, in our recent research, we have seen some of them raise their funding through both. Next slide, please. Moving on, let's have a look on the challenges faced by these companies. Next slide. 
To begin with, I will discuss on the challenges faced by Soundbrenner Limited and Atocube during the manufacturing process. Let's have a quick look into the two interviews by Dr. Neil. Yeah. Just on the manufacturing, what has been the biggest challenge here? Manufacturing in China, in Shenzhen? Yeah, we're manufacturing in Shenzhen. Right, okay. Right. So, so I, I would say the biggest challenge is just to actually make a good product. So you have right. to you know, work with your manufacturer to right. get all the details right. This is very interesting because the product originally may not have focused on those three things, but the feedback they got from buyers is environmentally friendly, the wood, environmentally friendly paint, so non-metallic and other chemicals, yes. non-toxic paint, because children are playing with it and they might they can completely eat it or suck on it or whatever. Yes. So it's got to, and then finally the edges, it shouldn't, be, it shouldn't scratch you to rub your finger on it, right? So so, as interviewed by Dr. Nguyen in the video on how Soundbrenner gets a number of challenges amongst which manufacturing process is one. The founder, Florian, says that coming from Germany to Shenzhen, getting all the product details right during the manufacturing process can be challenging. Attitude, on the other hand, also got a feedback from their consumers, that is kindergartens, as their ultimate consumers will be children they required their product to be safe and environmentally friendly. Attitude faced a challenge in producing the perfect fit for children, which should accommodate the consumer's feedback, also have smoother and rounded edges, and must not have any toxic paint, ensuring children's safety. Now I will pass it to Jessica to discuss further. Thank you. In next, I will be covering on the distribution challenge. There are three startups that I'll be discussing in this part, including the FIFI-FLY Electronics, Sonic Dots Korea, and Sound Breeder Limited. I will first cover the FIFI-FLY Electronics. Let's hear a bit about a video interview with the startups. So tell us about your, your plans for marketing and distributing this product. Uh, okay, now we are launching on the Indiegogo. Oh, on Indiegogo, yeah, wow. On Indiegogo. So yes. Now it's an Indie Mark. On Indiegogo, uh, yes, right? Indiegogo. Okay, so based on the video, they launched their anti-snoring product in Indiegogo. Furthermore, they're aiming to market their product to Europe and China market and they still looking for distributors in the USA. However, after some research, we found that they received bad reviews from both Indiegogo and Kickstarter, where most of the comments mentioned that the customers did not receive the products. We think that this must be one of the problems in the distribution process. This is essential that supply chain management include the process from where the product is being manufactured until it reached its consumers. Therefore, in this case, FIFI-FLY may have problem to deliver their products to their customers, which raise a point in the distribution part. Secondly, let's take a look at the Soundbrenner Limited. Florent, a big question. What has been your biggest challenge on this startup road so far? I think there's not, no one thing I would say. There's so many challenges. Which is the interesting part about hardware. Right. I guess the, you could you could say like this, the most challenging thing is that there are so many different areas you need to master and learn right. from uh, software because we have a mobile app, obviously yes. we need to do everything that a right. software startup has to do. We also have to hardware, supply chain management, right. manufacturing, wow. electronics, firmware programming, then retail distribution is a whole other industry yeah. that you could build a startup on. Which Just so in the video, the speaker mentioned that there are many areas of startup to master, including manufacturing, marketing, and distribution. Mainly a selection of a distribution channel for startups can be an overwhelming task because they have to find a distribution channel that will produce the most sales. Then they have to build a relationship with the channel members. And it's a two-way street. Hence, we agree with what the speaker said about that challenge mentioned in related to the supply chain process. And lastly, to illustrate the challenge of Sonic Dutch Korea, let's take a look at the video interview with the startups. Hey, 
this, we've got a real this is 20 kilograms in weight, right? Uh, okay, so I think I've got problem with my internet connection, but yeah. however, uh, it can put in the video that, uh, yeah, that they <laughs> They may have a distribution challenge due to the heavy machinery that they have, which is 20 kilograms for the coffee maker. Okay. So for the next part, uh, we will talk about the research and development, which is will be presented by Nikhil. Good evening, everyone. So the main reason, so I'm going to talk about the challenges faced by Sonic Dutch in the research and development process. So to sell such a new and different product in the market, uh, there's a lot of research that is needed uh, where you need to understand who your final consumer is going to be. And one of the main elements is also fixing our stable price. So these are some clearly some things which have not been fixed properly by them and uh, which were which did create a problem for them. So can we have the next slide? Um, next slide, please. Yes. So here you can see that in the video, they haven't explained who their ideal customer is, whether it's going to be a household, some coffee shops, or some high-end restaurants. So again, the cost of the product at retail is 2,000 wow. US dollars. Wow. So at 2,000 USD dollars, you can see the conversion rates in ringgits, Indian rupees, Singapore dollars, Hong Kong dollars, and the Chinese currency. So what happens here is, since in Asia, a lot, there are a lot of middle income families and for them to afford such an expensive product is not going to be a very easy thing. It's going to require a lot of thinking and it's going to also invest a lot of money into this. They're hard on money. A lot of it is going to go. Also, one of the main point is since Chinese people are known for making replica of such products, it'd be very easy for them to make such one at a very affordable rate, which can be afforded. So hence, these are the challenges that need to be addressed by the company. Thank you. And next, uh, Merchant is going to talk about the expansion of consumers. Hi everyone, I'm Chen. The company I will discuss today is Ujin. Due to the development of advanced technology, they have, re they have received a lot of crowdfunding funds. In this interview with its CEO, Mark Yu, we can know that their main product is called Advanced Smart Deeper Muscle Messenger, which is different from the market because 90% of the product that they use the low frequency for skin permission. But their own product use a unique medium frequency market wear to relieve muscle pressure. And their initial target market is professional sportsmen. But at this time, they are faced with the challenge of customer expansion. First of all, because there are too many similar products on the market, they cannot show their special point ideally. Secondly, there are restrictions on sales channel. As, as a Taiwan company, there are not many agents working with them. So they need to further expand sales channel and the regions to expand customer. Okay, next. Uh, therefore, in order to face this challenge and seize the opportunity that people pay more and more attention to the current fitness awareness, Eugene has found many ways to improve its sales channel. The first thing they do is to launch their own application, including software for regarding and using products and software for customers to communicate with each other, uh, which directly realize the promotion of the product and is increased for the customer for the same type. Then they quickly expand the sales channel that is Amazon Storm which allow them to compete with other products of the same type on a large platform because feedback of, from the online store can allow them to increase potential customers. Uh, as a product that mainly focuses on sports, they have also expanded their partner to the gym. Nowadays, uh, many professionals and ordinary people will go to the gym to keep healthy and using product can help them relieve pressure and protect them from the sports injury. It's also in the line with the pain point of this kind of people. 
finite the expansion of the sales area, not only local, but also targeting other parts of the world, which will help them to face the challenge of the customer expansion. Thank you. So, okay, I will pass to Joyce to talk about the patent. All right. All right, so now moving on to the last challenges, which is regarding the patent issue. Next slide. Hangzhou Chick Intelligent Technology produces scooters and hoverboards that consist from the Smart Cross and LS series. It has around 300 independent intellectual property rights, which include its patented product and licenses such as the ULCE, FCC, ROHS, and CTIC in order to ensure their highest safety and performance. However, intellectual property issue, such as patent infringement, has always been a difficult and common issue among tech company due to it having loopholes and technological product being in, imitated easily with a few changes made. From the interview, it can be discovered that many hoverboard companies, which can be called as copy one, are imitating cheap hoverboard and selling it at a lower quality and cheaper price. And these hoverboard are the bad apple you see in the news where it gets caught on fire or it malfunction. Moreover, consumers tend to not care whether the product have patent or whether it is of a high quality as they only focus on its cheap price. This also can be difficult for Chic as they spend a lot of resources and capital in obtaining the patent and licenses as well as maintaining its high quality production. In order to combat this, what Chic Hoverboard did is that they increased their research and development in order to innovate and improve further its product, as well as um, filing some patent infringement or suing other company for the issue. Next slide. And next slide. So in this table, uh, it showcases the summary of which company have which challenges, and it can be seen that sound banner have three challenges, Sonic Dutch have two, while the others only have one challenges. Next, we will do the Kahoot question. It's a pin. Uh, so I have provided the pin in the chat room. Ah, I'm ready. Okay, we have 10 players, that's 11. Santana, can you share your screen for the game? Oh. So we start, right? Prof. Okay, should Fif we start? What, 15 players, is there only 15 here tonight? I see 17, 18, 17, 18. 19. Don't forget, we're noting participation class. Seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. We have twenty now. Mm. So what, 20 out of 31. Ginny, how many do we have on our call tonight? Uh, 30. We have 30. Okay. Okay, I guess let's start. Who's running this? Um, okay. Sanzana. Okay. Good. Let's make a note of who's participating in this one, uh, Ginny. Okay. Yeah. Question one, ready. Any does not place any ado. Okay. 
Okay, let's go for the next one. Next. Well, that's a lot of variation. <laughs> okay, let's go for the next one. question. Well done, class. Okay, Qu any questions on this, please? Hi, I have, a, I have a question. I was wondering, is all the company operating now? Or I only had the challenges. I didn't really hear like, which company is operating now. Sorry, I didn't clear. That wasn't clear, the question. Sorry, I will type on the chat box. I think I have internet issue. No, it's okay. Just um, please go ahead. Uh, meanwhile, I have one quick question. Yes. Yeah. Um, if I'm not mistaken, one of the company, VVFLY, has a distribution challenges, right? That customers or consumers are complaining that the goods are not being received. So um, were there any uh, remedies made or were there any thing made by the company. Like were there any result? Were there any result um, that VVFLY did something to compensate to the customers or customer service, etc. Anything? Um, uh, we cannot find anything about the distribution problems. Because uh, when we look at the Indiegogo and Kickstarter, uh, the comment is still there, and they did uh, the company did not reply their comments or did not give any comment or reply something like that. So we're not sure about that. However, uh, this company still exists until now, and they they actually have uh, uh, they actually already sell their product in Amazon right now. However, in Amazon actually the rating is not quite high. It's only around 2.7 out of 5 in terms of rating. Mm. And um, the problem is not only in the distribution. Uh, in the Amazon, the consumer said that they received the product. However, the product did not work. Something mm. like that. Yeah. 
But for your question about the distribution, uh, we're not sure how they tackle about that. Okay. Yes. All right. Thanks. Okay, group. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you for that. Did uh, did go over time, so you need to be aware of that, especially for those uh, presenting next week and the week after. The big way to manage your time is to do lots of rehearsal. It's the only way. And so you keep the things moving forward. Uh, but very good on innovating in different uses of the video and things like that. So that's a um, great effort. Uh, class, we need a little bit more energy from you in the questions that you're asking because this is the end of the day, it's not just the assessment, it's about whether you are curious. Are you curious about the challenges that real companies are having in the supply chain? And the more curious you are, you will learn more. And what I want to do in the midterm break, and we'll come back to this curiosity thing, is that I wanted to run a session on how to get more job ready, especially in this area, in the area of supply chain management. In, you know, it doesn't mean you're actually managing a factory. You might be actually managing, you know, you might be managing di distribution or different elements of the supply chain in a region. So there's lots of jobs out there, but they normally go to people who are curious and people that want to solve problems and people that want to uh, learn that more every time that something uh, goes wrong with any company in managing their supply chain. So that curiosity does help in terms of job opportunities. So keep that in mind. Let's have a break. Time is over. We're over one hour into it now. So let's just have a five minute break. I'll see you back in five minutes. Okay. And great effort, both, uh, both groups. Not easy on the IoT startups, pretty challenging. Resume. Okay, we're resuming recording. Okay, next time we're going to play it in teams, but for now,
just going to turn the volume off because I can we turn the Kahoot volume off? That's better. Let me just share the screen and you'll see the password come up. Okay, so do you all have Kahoot now? Do you all see the Kahoot? Yes or no? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes. yes. Okay. We've got a bit more energy here. Energy room, we've only got six players. Where are we where are we tonight? Are we all watching TV or something, are we? Okay, now this some of these questions require you to give two answers or three answers. So in other words, there's four options but you have to choose not maybe one, two, three or four. So there may be multiple cor correct answers. Okay. You will have, for the multiple, you have 20 seconds. For the single, you will have 10 seconds. So we go slowly. There's 24 players. Uh, Ginny, how many do we have in the room? 25. 28. 28. We only have 28. Wow. Okay. Someone's Tony Stark. Okay. 27. We want one more. <coughs> Excuse me. Right, we have 27 players. Are you ready? Jimbe Hala, are you ready? Yes, sir. Yes. yes. All right, so let's go. In week one, what did we do? Let's have a look. Driving innovation and change. Are you ready for the first one? What was the big idea in week one? A single response. Okay, week one, we looked at macro factors, impact on where and how to source. Okay, we t mentioned the trade war, but we didn't say that that, ref that caused reshoring of production. If there's any reshoring of production, that would be very industry specific. Uh, COVID-19 negates the efficiency of the supply chain. We didn't talk about that uh, in that general terms. Uh, we talked about that in terms of it impacting on the bottlenecks, creating bottlenecks. Uh, so, uh, and COVID-19 impacts on the make or buy decision. Maybe it does, but we really didn't talk about that as a make or buy decision. Make meaning you don't outsource or you do outsource. Okay, so macro factors was the most uh, important thing that we looked at in week one. Are you ready for week two? Yes. Uh, okay. Yes, sir. Now week two is a multiple answer. That means you have 20 seconds. So you're not a little bit extra because you've got to choose more than one correct answer. Okay. Well done. Okay. Let's go. Multi-select. What were the big ideas in week two? Blockchain will revolutionize how control, how to control parts of the supply chain. Uh, 
Okay. Two big ideas. Blockchain will revolutionise how to control parts of the block of the supply chain. We did mention that, and especially we talked about those ta the tables about what elements of the supply chain. There was the information element, there was a physical element, there was a logistical element, there was the financial element. But then we cut it by different parts in terms of the pain points. Remember that? So go back and review that, how blockchain is impacting on the pain points of the supply chain. China 2025 is an example of government-led innovation in emerging economies. Uh, robotics is having a significant impact on supplier efficiency. Uh, yes and no. Robotics is being used sparingly. In some industries like automotive, it's taking over. But in a lot of other industries, it's only used sparingly and it's not taken over all of production. Finally, innovation is market-led in emerging economy. No, innovation is very much government government led uh, to the most part in a lot of emerging economies. Okay, let's go to the scoreboard. Okay, very good. Let's go to week three and see what, do you remember week three? <coughs> just, just let me help remind you. Week three was when we went from macro down to micro. Do you remember that? And I first introduced you to this whole uh, supplier competitive framework, remember? And if you put pressure on the supplier in one area, then the supplier will find some other way of getting around the pressure that you're putting on the supplier. Remember that? <clears throat> And the big exercise that you did was I actually gave, you had to actually review all of the surveys that did of suppliers or questions where I asked, what's your number one challenge? How are you responding? And you actually looked at that just to understand, well, a lot, the main challenges that suppliers were facing were competition and cost control. But I didn't ask you just to look at that. I asked you in your groups to focus on how are they responding to competition and cost control? Are they trying to improve themselves or are they responding in terms of fixing something outside? They're not doing, they're not improving themselves. They're, they're focusing on relationships. They're focusing on sourcing from fewer material supplies, so you get economies of scale. They're, they're trying to do more marketing, but they're not trying to get better themselves. And I told you in that week that the good suppliers are the ones that are trying to respond to cost control and competition by trying to improve their own operations. So they're looking at themselves for improvement and not looking outside for avoiding improvement themselves okay so are you ready <clears throat> multi-select so get ready big ideas Ah, okay. All right. So uh, the supply competitive market model, understand suppliers, how they respond to challenges. All right. The other one was buyers can easily squeeze their suppliers on costs for their benefit. Not really. You squeeze them, they'll find another way of getting around that. They might give you cheaper materials. They may do secret outsourcing. Um, suppliers will do the right thing when faced with higher competition. Uh, not always. That is not always the case. All right. So just uh, be careful on that one. Okay. So most of you got that right. So week four, what did we do in week four? Ladies and gentlemen, what did we do in week four? Are you still with me there? Can I, hello, hello. All right. Yeah. Come on. How, how we, 
Okay, mm. week four. What did we learn in week four? It was the big N word. What is it? Negotiation, right? Remember, we went negotiation. And so, what was negotiation about? Negotiation was all about asking questions. Uh, ah, very good. Very good. Uh, yeah, asking questions. Okay. And it was all about trying to understand the supplier. Okay. And you ask questions rather than you talk yourself, right? So are you ready for the question on week four? Again? Yes. Edgar, well done. You're doing very, very well in front. This is a single answer. The big idea in week four. Okay. All right. So remember, single answer, you only have 10 seconds. So you've got to be fast, class. All right. All right. Model answer, you have 20 seconds. Okay. So uh, buyers who adapt, should adopt partner when negotiating. No, that is the Harvard business model where that's the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. That is, you go into the supplier and say, well, I've, as I've got this other supplier who's 10% cheaper than you, so you better give me 10%. That's the last thing. You're not going to win any negotiation with that. The supplier, yes, I'll give you 10% less, but on the second order, they will kill you. They will just put the prices up. So they'll find a way to get around any partner approach. Buyers should adopt a take or leave approach to negotiations. Absolutely not. Uh, buyers are safe to buy without negotiating. Buyers should research several supplier alternatives before negotiating. Exactly. And that's what you did in week four, because what you did was you went out and got a request for quotation. Am I right? Yes, yes you did. Yes. You did that. And, and in groups, I asked you to go through the request for quotation and try and pick out the three best quotations that you, you yourself would buy from, you would negotiate with. Ah, and then you, what you realize from that exercise is, ah, oh, we should have asked exactly the same questions to all the suppliers. So then we can compare apples with apples. But when you started looking at that spreadsheet of all those quotations, they weren't all directly comparable. Some had different lead times, some had different uh, materials, they had different specifications, some had child size, some had adult size, and you couldn't compare everything perfectly. Uh, so that's what we learned, and that was a big idea in week four, uh, researching supplier alternatives. The other big idea in week four, Adgar, you were very, you were correct, and that was you should ask questions to the suppliers all the time. So that's very, very good. Okay, so week five, what did we do in week five? Hello? Due diligence. Due diligence. Ah, wait a minute, remember three circle control framework? Uh, the top circle was all about the relationship, remember? Then we go down to the circle on the side where we looked at uh, due diligence, uh, contracting. Remember, there's contracting, verifying, making sure we have a real supplier. And that week, we looked at a, a research study of mine. What did I study in that research study? What was I studying? Scams. Scams, exactly. They were the, they were the complaints made by buyers over many, many years, over a thousand complaints. And then what we studied was, oh, if we have the really bad complaints versus the well, the minimal complaints like quality or lead time, but the bad ones where they took your money and didn't get your money back, there were many different governance mechanisms you could undertake to actually reduce the bad scam happening to you, right? Remember? And as a group, each of your groups in your breakout groups, you had to go and find, you had you had to go and think about, okay, which of these governance mechanisms, there was nine of them, remember? Nine, okay. Contracting, third party audit, buyer visit, third party visit, verification, FOB, 
contingent payment. Remember, and you had, I asked you which three out of those nine were most important in preventing the scam happening on this database. Remember that? And most of you got that right. You, you know, contracting was important uh, by uh, verification, uh, by a visit or the factory audit. These are all important things. Okay, so let's have a look at the question for that week, shall we? This is a multi-select, so you have 20 seconds. They're big ideas, more than one idea. Okay, all right, so this is hard, isn't it? It's hard when you have to do multiple. It, it, it's not easy, all right? Uh, buyers should set the contract with the idea that things can go wrong. Remember, I gave you a whole list of things that can go wrong. So it's very important that the buyer set up a contract with that idea. The other one, buyers should work closely with third party inspectors. So that remember I told you, I gave the example of the, the inspector that does the knife sharpening. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. And, but the other one, the buyer should do the quality check themselves. Now you always, you get a third party inspector to do the quality check <coughs> because that was related to avoiding the scam. A good supplier has many different products for sale. No, that's a bad supplier. Don't ever touch a supplier that thinks they can sell you 20 different products. They're likely to be a middleman or an agent or a scam. Okay, so now we're into week six. And remember week six was last week, am I right? Hello, are you there? <laughs> okay, yes. week six. All right, so oh, let's have a look at the leaderboard. Sorry, you want to Adgar, you're back up on top. Well done. All right, big smile of Adgar there. All right, so remember week six, was it? We looked at the last, the third circle of the three circle control framework, and that's where we were looking at the auditing, remember? And one group presented an audit, you know, there's factory A, factory B, and, and another big takeaway from last week was the AQL, remember the AQL? <clears throat> AQL calculation? Hello, and I gave you two quality audit reports and you had to actually do the computation to find out whether you accept or reject the product based on the AQL limit, which was the acceptable quality limits. So are you ready for the question on this one? Yes. Okay, now remember if it's um, multiple, you have 20 seconds. And it is multi-select. <laughs> okay. All right. Well done. <laughs> <clears throat> Let's have a look at this. The owner mindset is critical in judging a supplier. Remember the audit I did and I, I showed you one of the owner of the earphones and he striked me as being like a Steve Jobs. In other words, he wanted to make the best product in the world. He had the mindset to make focusing on the product and not just focusing on making money and buying property or whatever, okay? Uh, so owner mindset is critical. And the other one, the AQL limit for a major defect is uh, anything greater than 2.5%. A minor defect is greater than, normally greater than 4%, okay? So you allow 4% for minor. Remember that major is the 2.5, okay? So you've got to, you've got to, less tolerance for the major defect. 
Okay, you can check that. If I'm, if I'm wrong, come and let me know. Okay, so we have our scoreboard. So, Adgar, congratulations. Okay, we're going to have a break from Kahoot for a moment because it's the night is not over. <coughs> Excuse me. Just, um... <coughs> There are two more groups of Kahoot questions. In total, there are 14 questions. We have done six. We have eight to go. All right. So I will be scoring you tonight. So watch out. Uh, the leaderboard stays as it is. I'm just going to show you. Can you see my PowerPoint slide? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Okay, I asked many of you to watch the video by Mike Bellamy. And part of it is, well, maybe you get sick of watching me all the time. So it's always good to watch someone else and sort of like a guest presenter type thing. But it's not to make sure that this is presented by him. But uh, Mike, I, I'm just going to give you a brief summary of the video. And then, then we're going to do several questions in Kahoot based on the summary I give now. Okay. All right. Uh, so are you ready? All right. So what basically Mike was telling you about, and it really doesn't start talking about IP protection until probably about 10 minutes into that 30 minute video. And he first of all talks about s supplier selection, all right? So it's, it's always important. IP protection is about knowing who you are contracting with. So, and maybe getting to know the owner, the owner of the supplier, and not just the agent of the supplier. That can help if you really understand what the owner's mindset is, then it's more likely that you can put things on paper and have an agreement that you can trust will be honored. Okay, so selection is probably number one. Uh, contracting was another thing that he mentioned. And the big thing about the contract, what we learned in week five was it's very important to put in a lot of terms uh, with the idea that something might go wrong. So oh, maybe there's a delay in delivery. Well, then we need to have a clause to say, oh, if there's a delay by, for every two days of delay, I will get 2% discount on the order. So 10 days delay, we'll get 20% discount. Or you might have a clause to say, if there's more than two days delay, the supplier has to send the product to my country by air freight. All right. So that's an example of, you know, contracting. And though what's relevant to IP protection they talked about in contracting was having a triple N agreement that non-disclosure, non-complete, and um, it, it covers everything that stop you from actually sharing any information, whoever's a party to that agreement. And what they're talking about now is that you actually get the factory, the, the factory to agree with a triple N, but they actually agree that they will compensate you as a supplier if any of their employees are associated with the leakage of any IP information. And like for a star, for a IOT startup, this is so critical, okay? So a triple N agreement is very important, non-complete, non-disclosure, and that's what that agreement is. And that's a normal thing in the industry. And that's something that you do with a supplier, but it's very important that you 
what Mike was talking about, that when you get the supplier to fill out that agreement, you do it in front of all of their employees or you do it in front of their partners or their directors. And so if they, <clears throat> if they were to dishonor that agreement, then they're going to lose face within their own community. And so, you know, in different countries, that will work to a stronger degree or to a lesser degree. But that's something that Mike talked about in the video. Okay, what he also talked about was this notion of monitoring and physical protection. So, and I'm going to talk more about that tonight. And what do we mean by monitoring and physical protection? Well, that is to do with having a factory that, uh, what do we call it? It's a black box factory. Uh, a physical protection is a factory that is separated from the suppliers and the suppliers send goods to that factory to be made. Now, I'm gonna show you a quick video that shows you uh, Mike's factory because he has a black box factory. Did you know that? So how many of you have seen a black box factory before? Anyone? Okay, so let me just, let me, I think I can show you. Let me hopefully. Okay, this is going across the border in Sinjin. Yes, so we're off to see three factories and we're going to learn something and find out what's going on. In okay, so now we're going to the... This is one. Jane, what do you have? America banned import. One more. Oh. Let's go to the next one. I was hoping to see Mike's factory. Ah, uh, here we go. So we just got through customs. This is in Sinjin, just across the border. Now it's at, we're in Sinjin now. So just going up to the Shangri-La Hotel, which is just up here. Right, we're going up here now. See you soon. So just going down to the passage maker factory now. Uh, Mike, pardon? Mike lives up here. Uh, he doesn't. He lives uh, not far from here, but the office is here. Wow. Yeah. So uh, probably come from the same. Yes, probably come from the same state. And uh, yeah. So we're going to Passage Maker now, and we're going to check it out. Passage is Maker Jet. is the Great name stuff. of the black box factory. So it's all happening. Special properties. Right. Okay. Suppliers. Yeah. So do you remember? Do you remember the big fish? Remember the big fish? Okay. Oh, okay. Right. So, the, okay. I guess our, right. our niche is that we also have a, a, a Woofy a contract assembly area that I founded. So, no Chinese partners where we get together stuff. Okay, I just want to turn it up a little bit. I don't know if it's too loud. Like that. And that's where we'll drive up this afternoon. So, Mike will drive so, us to his factories, um, but this, we're, the we're in his agency, office at the moment. Manufacturing infrastructure and but we don't usually is it sustainable no, no, no. in China to make it very easy. Okay, so now we're driving to his factory. Now remember the whole idea of this factory is to protect the buyer's IP from the supplier. Yeah, that's what we said. Okay, so this is what we call physical protection. Getting up getting higher fifteen percent of question, so there's a significant then Oh, you're sort of renting that. Okay, so okay, here's the so factory there's several factories here. here, is that right? Yeah, there's probably 20 factories. Oh, wow. That's it. That's okay. it there. Oh, that's awesome. So we've made it. This is on your website, this picture. Uh, okay. So we're at Passage Maker. All right, welcome. Go and check it out. Well, thank you. Well, just uh, cue me on. Uh... Okay, here we are. We're at Passage Maker. Well, 
have a lot of people on the production line and then a small group in the front office to do the doc. The factories don't bother especially because if, if they make the same thing over and over again then they get so what you've got here is a bare production room and what happens is buyers will go to Mike and they'll contract with him to actually use this room to do secret assembly that no one knows and because Mike has his own employees, they come in, they do the assembly, they do the packaging, and then they send it overseas and the suppliers don't know where the product went. So this is what, this is a black box. Okay. So in some ways that is the ultimate, that is the ultimate in IP protection. That is you do physical protection. The other ways of physical protection is you actually control the tooling or you actually go to the trade show and you look for suppliers and you see if you, you looked at me suppliers, but you look for those suppliers that are not showing the products of their customers. Because if you contract with those suppliers, you may find that your product becomes a showpiece in a future trade show and then your competitors see your product and then, you know, so, uh, you can't do anything about it. All right. So these are different ways of monitoring, You're monitoring the factory, uh, using a black box factory or actually controlling the tooling because the tooling is a secret source uh, for making various shells of products and then go into the trade shows to make sure that, well, if this supplier is good, uh, is that supplier hiding their products of their major customers? And if they are, that means they're going to hide your products too. Okay, so these were, you know, the whole idea was not for you to know all the actual law of IP protection. It, what was more important was you to understand that there are, for the multinational, we're going to go into it in more detail soon. That is, they've got to go to non-contracting ways of thinking about how would they protect their IP. Because startups don't have the resources to go to the court like Apple does, like Samsung does, like HP, right? Startups don't have the resources to take suppliers to court and fight over IP violations. Okay. Of course you can do that, but that's not startups. That's the last thing on their mind that they need to worry about. As you found from the two presentations, several of the startups have failed and because the whole idea of getting product to market is, is speed to market and getting things done quick and actually communicating, coordinating the supply chain. So startups don't have the luxury of just relying on a contract. And that's why a lot of uh, um, startups would do better by focusing on physical protection, okay? Owning the tooling, uh, black box factory, trade shows, and that's how, IP is protected. One more thing that uh, Mike Bellamy did also mention was that that in China, and this might be the case in other countries, and so not we're not just talking about China here, but for the most part, China is it's the first to register, not first to market. And so China, Mike talks about an example of what suppliers will do. They'll go to trade show, and they'll find new they'll find products that they think, oh, this has not been sold in China yet. Ah, I'll go to Beijing or Guangzhou and get that product registered, even though they're not even selling it. And then they get registered under their own name. Then in years to come, when the buyer's successful overseas and they suddenly want to sell it in China, uh, they can't sell it in China because someone else has the actual trademark or the IP and... Yeah, Apple's got into trouble with that too, with the iPad. 
uh, they had to pay a huge sum of millions of dollars to a Chinese uh, business because the Chinese business were first to register uh, before Apple started selling a product in, in China. So th there's just a bit of uh, what Mike was talking about. The big, the big thing I want you to take home tonight is that, look, in a perfect world, if it's say, I'm in the US and I'm contracting with the UK, I'm contracting with someone in Australia or Singapore in, or in a developed country where there's a rule of law, yes, I can rely on a contract. And for the most part, the contract will protect me. But when you are working with suppliers in developing countries, you can't always rely on a contract. And so a big takeaway tonight is to think about alternative ways of protecting your IP. So let's go to the Kahoot. We've got a few questions that will cover what I just talked about. Ah, okay. Everyone's paying attention now because they know that, uh, Agar, you're paying attention because you're put, you may not be last, you may not be first in a few questions time. So watch out. Okay, all right. I, I'm, all right, next question. It's a quiz. Number seven, multi-select. How do you protect your IP? Okay. All right. Here we go. Okay, all right. These there's three correct answers here. Okay. Uh know who you're dealing with. Remember, if you know who that supplier who the owner is, it makes a big difference. Know where the production is. Okay, Mike talks about that. Uh discuss the issue of supplier outsourcing. Suppliers will secretly outsource if they think they can get it for cheaper and not tell you. But you should discuss that issue because that's a chance for IP leakage to occur. Okay, there's, um, there's another question which is very similar to this one. And so let's have a look at the leaderboard here. Okay, all right, S is catching up. Who is S by the way? Come on, hello. All right, okay, here's the next one, similar. It's a similar question, multi-select. How do you protect your IP physically? This is physically. Okay, a lot of you got a lot of, right? Uh, right here, compartmentalized production. And that is, you break it up. That is no one supplier makes everything for you. And uh, Mike's own black box factory is a way of helping to compartmentalize production. Own the tooling, okay? Don't let the supplier own the tooling because your IP could be wrapped up in that. Uh, visit the supplier is not going to help you uh, and don't pay up percent. 100% uh, up front, that doesn't uh, help you uh, with IP protection. Remember, we're talking about IP protection here. Uh, it's not about whether you get scammed or not. Okay, scoreboard. Okay. Edgar, you're doing very, very well. Now let's, uh, I need to... Um, How to monitor the IP. Okay, most of you've got a lot of these right. So well done, well done again. Monitor the trade show. I just mentioned it, talked about that. 
and frequent audits and inspections. You know that from last week and monitoring the wear marks of the tooling. What does that mean? Well, you've got tooling. If there's wear marks that have changed from the last two months and you haven't ordered anything to be made with that tooling, then something's going on without your blessing. And that's something you need to be aware of. Okay, so uh, there's the scoreboard. Uh, great effort again. So that takes us up to nine. And I think we've got five questions left. Let me just double check here. I need to just check the questions. I don't want to run into my last part of my lecture. Okay, that finishes the second part of the quiz. And that takes us up to nine. We have, you still have a chance to win because there's five more questions left and that's under driving innovation. So what we're going to do now, we'll have another, we'll have a seven minute break. When we come back, I'm going to give you the formal lecture on driving innovation and change. Uh, it's kind of two parts. The first part, is, I'll take you through, th through the KPMG report that I wrote and which was based on my interviews with uh, several senior executives of uh, multinationals and major companies in this region. And then that will finish the quiz. And then after that, we will then I will give a presentation of six startups myself that two other group, two groups tonight, they did six each. Well, I'm going to do six too because six is a lucky number tonight. All right. So have a break for, let's have a break for eight minutes. I'll see you back in eight minutes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, are we all back? Can we have a big hello from everyone? Hello. <clears throat> hello. 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 Come on. Come on. <laughs> hello. hello. Okay, let me uh, give you a test. Okay. Let me. The, First test for you, okay. Uh, what, have, what have I got here? All bang. Okay, so if, if, if I want to scam a buyer as a supplier, what can I do? What do I do? What's in? Sp explain, Haley. speak louder. Um, to increase the weight during QC. Yes. So to um, avoid the Q, uh, quality control investigator, sort of? Sort of. I think you're on the right track there. You put sand inside to keep the same weight. Okay, so yeah. we're going to teach you how to do a scam, right? You, you need to think like this. When you're the buyer, you've got to think of all the different ways that you can be scammed okay and so then if you know that's going to happen what do you tell the qc person to do inspect the interior elements as well no it's you can't you can't you can't pull it apart so what what can you ask the qc the to charging do? the charging efficiency yeah just plug it into a power meter and just find out 
how much ampere I was coming out of it. Simple, all right? Ah, okay, good. Just just seeing if you're on the ball because I, I don't want any of you being scammed, all right? Especially after you've taken my course. I'd be very, very disappointed. All right, so what are, we, what are we up to tonight? So let's share the screen. I'm going to share the screen and don't forget, there's five more questions in the Kahoot. So all of you have a chance to win tonight. So, uh, and you're all going to win tonight. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about the first part is driving innovation and change because ultimately if we want to work with suppliers we need to think in over the long term and this is actually it's morphing into what multinationals will do okay because remember in, two, in three weeks four weeks time we're going to be talking about well, what do multinationals do well they're starting to do some of the things we're going to talk about tonight so just uh, keep in mind that and I just want to show you uh, a report. I'll put this into Moodle so you can all download it. This is a report that I wrote for KPMG uh, a few years back. So a report on uh, Made in China, the future of manufacturing sourcing in China. And then that was uh, with Anson Bailey. And then I interviewed all of these people. Uh, and Lord de Courts. Global Director of Sourcing for Puma, um, Christophe Rissell, Big Ideas. He's now a Global Director of Sourcing for Gap. And then H&M, I interviewed Anna from H&M, Project Leader, New Business Fashion. And Rotorex, we're going to talk about that tonight. And Renault, uh, currently working with him at the moment. And I know some, I've got an RA working with him at the moment as well and he's a very good friend and been working together for many many years in fact i just had someone contact me on linkedin just one week ago a startup very quickly i'll tell you this is all uh let me just uh pull up my linkedin so i can show you the reality of help that people need okay let me just uh bring this out and I'll show you my messaging, uh, notifications, messaging. All right, just tell me, is this coming up on your screen? Yes or no? Yes, sir. All yeah. right. So uh, let's have a look. Here's Rajiv. Uh, let's see, because we're talking about startups tonight, right? Dear Dr. O'Connor, I run a hardware startup, Rotor Labs, based in Singapore. This was only... Uh, this was only a few days ago. Our first product range is power, solar powered smart water bottles. We do all hardware design, PCB design in house. However, we're planning to manufacture in China. Oh, <laughs> oh no. All right. Okay. Would you know any reliable PCBA factory that also offers assembly services? The challenge we are facing is in assembly, the cost efficient PCB. Vendor, a vendors have great costs but do not help us with assembly and so i say let me get back to you with a connection thanks neil okay so up a zoom call with main director so i'm saying we're doing a zoom call either tomorrow or next day and uh that's that's how you help people class it's there's no fancy advertising or anything like that you know a lot of thing a lot of things that uh, startups have to go with is just through connections in their community uh, and that's that's the world we have today and then I want to just show you the this is like real consulting that we're that I'm doing that happened just in the last week without you it, before uh, you know before I saw you last so let me just see Renault hi okay let me just see if this is working out um, just okay, so the upshot is that um now we've got a Zoom call with Renal from So So S O Feast, 
and what we're going to do is just go through uh, what we can do. Uh, and so I wrote, it's not, look, class, it's not like I know everything, okay? But one thing that can benefit you to think about is you developing the professional network of who can you go to so you can be of help to someone else. Do you, are you with me here? All right, we're going to talk more about that when I talk about your job opportunities. So here's, so I emailed Renault, do you know anyone who can help? So I, I pass that contact to Renault and then he, write, he writes back to me, you have two options, blah, 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 blah. And they have experience and he's got a solution. So then we set up a Zoom call to introduce him and then hopefully they do business with Renault. Uh, class, um, that's how it works, okay? It's not, it doesn't get any more fancy than that, okay? We're, uh, and this is why I'm just so excited to teach this supply chain stuff because i connecting people that, that need help with um, people that can provide that help. Okay, so, and driving innovation and change. I just showed you a KPMG report, advice from consultants. Now, can you all see the PowerPoint slide? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Sir. Okay, good, good. All right, so uh, there's about three or four questions we've got in Kahoot relating to this. So get your Kahoot hat ready uh, because, uh, you know, great things are going to happen. Uh, there's one, two, three, four, five. There's five questions in Kahoot. All right. So first of all, when I talk to uh, these people in, this is from the KPMG study and the big ideas consulting, I thought, well, what's the big idea and, you know, what have you learned over the years and what can you share with me in terms of how do you drive innovation and change in the supply chain? But let me tell you one thing that's, uh, that's going to, you know, that's not going to let up and that is, so we're recording, okay, good, we're recording, yep. One thing that's not going to change is the fact that things are going to go fast after COVID. Like things are not going to go back to 2019 in the supply chain management world uh, after we get a vaccine, okay? Things are going to just go to a whole new level of how we manage. Now, I know one group you're going to be interviewing or working with Pivot88. I'm in contact with them at the moment because they provide a virtual tablet device that enables to get digitalized signals from the factory and so you can actually monitor the factory from a distance ah wow all right so what did um christoph tell me from big ideas consulting win the heart and mind of suppliers how to beat big guys moving information versus creating value there's a lot of moving information going around but what we need to always be constantly on the prowl for is how can we create value um, in our connection. So for example, I'm creating value for this startup by connecting that startup with Renault. We have the Zoom call and we hopefully we get a solution. All right. Uh, when I talk to Tel Apparel, which is one of the largest white shirt manufacturers in USA, um, and Weave, which is a consulting company under Tel Apparel, I ask them, okay, so, you know, what do you think is needed to drive innovation and change? So Big Ideas Consulting tell me, oh, you need to consolidate the supplier base. Uh, tell Peril, they ask, well, you need to make sure you integrate, integrate the supply chain so you get better efficiencies with in inventory management. Uh, Weave Consulting, which is under Tel Apparel, they say, well, you need to think about these three big trends. That is the total cost of ownership, the design to cost and production planning. Class, if you ask me, you know, what are the big three things going on? And this is especially in apparel uh, supply chains at the moment. Total cost of ownership is all about, yes, it's great that you can have a low FOB price, but if the supplier can't promise you a particular lead time and then your forecast needs to, 
you know, give or take two or three days, then that's going to cost you more because that's two or three more days of variability in your forecasts that you may need to pay shippers or truckers or distributors at the other end of your supply chain. Ah, so, you know, the total cost of ownership is about the total cost of the whole chain. Ah, wow. All right. It's, so the FOB price is not the only, it's only just one little part. Remember up until now, up and, you know, up until now, like last three or four weeks, we we're talking about the FOB price, right? And the supplier, but you need to also consider other aspects. Can that supplier deliver on time all the time? Uh, can, you know, what's the variation in quality? Because then that can create more ripple effects down the supply chain. Ah, and so another, you know, so focusing on the whole cost of means and supply chain is critical and how the supplier fits into that is a very big trend. Uh, another one is design to cost. That's a big issue that you need to be aware of. Now you've got these PowerPoint slides you can download from Moodle so you have access to this. All right, design to cost. What do we mean by that? What we mean is that um, if you're making a car and you're selling a low cost car, maybe you have cheap carpet in the car. Maybe you have a cheap exhaust pipe. Why? Because the people that are buying your car, they just want to have a comfortable seat and they don't care about other parts of the car or the carpet. They just want a comfortable seat and go from A to B. And so therefore you design to the cost. But if you're making another luxury product, then you look for other luxury items that the customers use to make their buying decision. And then that's where you design in more expensive items. But anything that the customer doesn't see, you design in cheap items. That's what the car manufacturers do. So that's what we mean by design to cost. You design, that means you don't, all the, all the see everything in the smartphone, see that glass, Gorilla Glass, it's the best in the world, right? But there might be, some components inside that are so cheap or they don't look very good. Why? Because I don't see it. So why, why should they care about me, the customer, if I'm not going to see something cheap inside the smartphone? That's what we mean by design to cost. So you, uh, how do you design the cost? You start with asking, what do the customers look for in your product? And if they're not looking for a certain part or a feature and you still want to put that feature in that product, then you make the cheapest part that is needed for that feature because the customer is not going to care if it's working or not. Ah, do they do that? Sure they do. Don't, don't you know that uh, the parts in the cars they make these days, a lot of parts don't last longer than five or six years. Why? Because in a lot of countries, um, in Japan, the average car the age is only uh, three or four years at the most. In Hong Kong, you know, people trade them in after they're three years old. It's not like, um, so why would you make a car to be sold that has parts in it that's going to last for 15 or 20 years? It's going to be on a scrap heap after 10 years. So that, that's what we mean by design the cost. You just... You don't try and put in perfect things that customers don't value into a product. It costs you more. You're not going to make money. And finally, production planning, another big trend. What do we mean by production planning? Uh, what we're saying here is that maybe you make all different colors socks, but cr at Christmas time, you need to have all the rainbow socks. You need to have the pink, the green, the mauve, and the yellow, and all the different plus the black socks. All right, but maybe the black socks are in demand all year round. It's just the colored socks are in demand at Christmas time. So what you do as a factory, you make sure that you make the black socks in the off season. You don't make the black socks during Christmas because that's when you need production capacity to make the other colors. Ah, so, you know, this is production planning. You don't need to have a bigger factory. It's about how you schedule the production and a lot of suppliers 
they don't always understand production planning. They just think, oh, oh, this customer is better than that customer. Oh, this customer will, will make his product first because I think we have a better relationship. Um, and, and somehow it's not driven by it's better to actually make one product before another because you have the raw materials for that first product, but you don't have all the raw materials for that second product. Ah, you know, so the, you know, production planning is always about thinking about how to minimize bottlenecks. So there's three big trends there, total cost of ownership. That's the whole supply chain designed to cost. That is not everything in a product has to be perfect. Only those features that customers want and production planning is, you know, it's getting, it's about helping the supplier improve their processes in planning their production. Wow. Uh, okay, so that's what we learned from when I was talking to these consultants. And I've got to, you know, there's some issues here, but I, I want to summarize them in, in the following. And that's, follow, and that's following. Okay. Um, I took them and then I made this. I made this based on all of those interviews. And this is in the KPMG report. Uh, probably first of all, if you're gonna drive innovation and change or actually improve uh, the supply chain, remember, all right, supply chain management is not going to be useful if you're just doing coordination and no development. What I mean coordination is making sure that product gets from A to B on time, every time and forecasts are done and everything. But over time, you know, and I know that costs go up, you know, and I know that products have to be developed, you know, and I know that um, factories get lazy, you know, and I know that factories develop dust, they machines are not maintained. Um, things go downhill if things are not maintained. Uh, you know, and I know that factories need to be in continuous improvement. Otherwise, if they're not in continuous improvement going up, they're actually in continuous de deterioration going down. Ah, so it's so critical that you are focusing you're thinking about, you know, one, two, and three. So how do you do that? Well, number one, you need to work closer with suppliers. And this is a big trend of, uh, of the big multinationals. And the first step would be to consolidate the supplier base. This is what all the consultants are saying. Oh, how many suppliers do you have? 120. Well, cut that down to 50. Okay, that's 70 suppliers you don't have to talk to. That's 70 orders you don't have to make. That's 70 problems that you're not going to have to worry about immediately. All right. There's, oh, by the way, the, you know, once you start talking to these multinationals and large buyers, it's not unusual for them to have hundreds of suppliers. It's not unusual. Okay. All right. For a startup, they might have one or two suppliers, but once you get larger, they just, it just grows, grows and grows. And it gets to a point where a consultant comes in and says, tells them the obvious, oh, you've got too many supplies, consolidate. So um, number one, consolidate. And that's all about integration, improving accountability systems. And when you consolidate and you have fewer suppliers, that means you can collaborate more and you can visit each supplier more frequently and you can develop a stronger relationship and develop trust. Okay, so that's the basics. But if you really want to add value as a consultant, you need to go to one step further, and that is improve efficiencies. How do you do that? Ah, write this down. Three things to do, and I ask this to one consultant, what's three things I can do tomorrow if I'm a factory and if I want to reduce costs? Three things. It's in front of you. I'll make it easy. Cut inventory, cut administration costs, process improvement. Bang, bang, bang. Easy. 
okay? And why do I say that? Because inventory costs money to hold, and you know, the opportunity cost of holding inventory. I went into one supplier, and you saw that supplier in week one or week two, they made the audio equipment to go into cars, and at any one time they had one to two million dollars ringgit more of inventory in their in their factory, waiting to be collected by the car motor vehicle manufacturers. So that's money. You take the average of that. So you 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 halve it, and then that's the average. Uh, you halve that, and that's the average for twelve months of carrying that amount and you multiply it by 20% or the opportunity costs and you can see that costs money. Cut administration costs, how do you do that? You just, you've got to fire inefficient staff, replace them with automated software. Okay, uh, customer management software, process improvement, which is something that uh, we can talk about another time, but process improvement is about like what I do in my pro bono advice, given suggestions to suppliers about how to better plan the whole assembly line. Or well, one assembly line I went in and it's just getting, do they face the assembly line or do they face side onto the assembly line? You know, little things like that. And you've already done that in several groups in your presentations. You've, you're starting to see uh, how some factories do things different from others. And once you see those differences, that's when you start to get ideas for how you can improve the processes. Okay, so, and then finally, we ideally would like to change management. Like that's the long-term. This is very short-term. This is something that, you know, we can do over the short to medium term. But then when we go to three is change management. And that's where we've got to, understand who the owner is. If they have a short-term mindset, you can't do much because anything you change is not going to stay changed or the perceived opportunity costs of investment are too high. In a lot of developing countries, there's the perception that it, uh, if, I, if I have a million dollars, should I put it into a machine or should I put it into property? And I can tell you now, if I asked all the factory owners around the region, in Southeast Asia, in India, in China, the majority will say property, not a machine. All right, like that's, it's, it's, it's a common sense thing that property appreciates its value, whereas a machine depreciates and doesn't, <laughs> get more valuable over time. Um, but that's the opportunity costs that a lot of factory owners face in the region. And when you're aware of that, that's how you can differentiate whether a owner is really in the business for making the best product or they just in the business to make money to buy property. Uh, and so, you know, one, two, and three, these are the three different levels and it's like peeling an onion if you can do more in the red area, then you can do more for the long-term improvement of the factory. Whereas the one and two are a little, they're much more cosmetic and they don't stay sustainable unless you can work on the owner's mindset. Ah, okay. So in summary, money, Skills and owner mindset remains the biggest obstacle to innovation and automation in a lot of in a lot of factories in the region. Okay, so we go to Kahoot now, and we're going to do a few. Qu Are you ready with your Kahoot? Uh, let me have a look. Uh, we're going. Did we? Let me just have a look. Make sure that I don't. Stop it. Okay, are you ready? Jumbe Hala. Yes, sir. Okay, so again, it's a review of just what I've covered now. So let's have a look. Our next quiz, number 10, multi-select. What are the benefits of consolidating the supplier base? Uh, 
Okay, answer helps focus on good suppliers and helps to improve accountability and trust. Okay, now remember, you could argue that all of these are correct, but uh, indirectly the other two are correct, but not, this is the two big reasons that you put forward for consolidating the supplier base. Uh, next. Okay, all right, someone's paying attention. Multi-select again. What are the three big trends in apparel sourcing? The three big trends. Everyone should get this right. Okay. Total cost of ownership, design to cost and production planning. Okay, congratulations on that. Okay. Next question. Ah, Nicole did very well on that one. Very good. And Zoe and Haley, Joey doing very, very well. How to cut costs quickly. Okay, there was only two correct ones here. All right, hire more experienced office staff. No, you fire office staff, replace them with automation, all right? Now automate, yeah, it's partly correct, but it's not, it's, remember, how to cut costs quickly, all right? Immediately, how do you actually cut costs quickly? Okay, automation, yes, it takes a little bit longer to, but you can cut costs with automation, but it's not quickly. Okay, uh, Okay. one more question. Han, very good on that one. Nicole was doing well. Where to start? Where do you start? Consolidate the supplier base. Remember, consolidation. Then you're focusing on efficiency. Then you're working on change management. One, two, and three. Okay. Now, the last one is part of the... There's one last one. So we're going to come back to that. And this is it. We're on the home stretch now. The rise of the hardware startup. Wow, the rise of the hardware startup. Du -du -du -du. Okay, so what do we mean by the rise of the hardware startup? Because we hear so much about software startups. We hear so much about internet startups. But look at this. Like this is a couple of years old, but even more recent years, I've got a, I've got a slide here to show you. Can you all see this? Yes or no? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. All right. Like this is more recently of um, startups in China. Uh, I just want to be very, but some of these were around when I took out this about two years ago. And the ones in yellow are hardware. So Xiaomi is now IPO, DJI Innovation, they make drones, Menzu Technology, Royal Corporation. Take a note of that, Royal Corporation. That's $3 billion in worth. Even more recently, uh, Royal is still up there. November 2016, uh, 3 billion. Okay, so what we're gonna do now is have a look at Royal Corporation. And this is Sabrina uh, that I interviewed for the Startup Launchpad. I don't, okay. And so what was special about this is that 
they're the owner is like a Steve Jobs and he's looking at making the world's thinnest foldable full color touch screen display. And this unicorn already has 600 patents, 280 million VC investment. And the owner just recently invested 1.6 billion in a heavy automated factory with integrated R&D complex. Like, what did I just say five minutes ago? The biggest barrier to long-term innovation is the owner's mindset. Remember? Remember? Consolidate supply base, cut costs, but then you've got to work on the owner mindset to drive sustainable change. And here's another example of, of Royale. The owner is investing 1.8 billion in an automated factory. Like he could have just put that into property. You with me here, right? So this is why I mean that there are good factories out there. And if you've, you're always looking for the owner that really wants to make the best in the world. And he believes that well, 2016, it was worth 150 billion, but double that by today. But his idea is that in the future and not too long, maybe in two or three years time, you'll have a coffee cup with an LCD display around it. And that display will have advertising on it. And that coffee cup will just be in a restaurant and the advertising will be on the coffee cup and you'll drink your coffee. And it'll be displayed. That, that's only a few years around the corner. Little things like that. And uh, this is part of his vision for the future. So this is an example of an owner's vision. Now, when I interviewed for the KPMG report, I interviewed all of these companies here and I talked about some of them. Now, what am I going to show you now is examples of six startups and how they protected their IP. Remember, what is the big theme for tonight? It's about protecting the IP. Yes or no? big theme and and you know an accompanying theme was um, who best can we learn from if we really want to understand the problems and challenges of supply chain management MMCs or startups we are, it's better to learn from startups why because if they make one mistake they're dead gone never see them again Right, one mistake. And so let's let me take you through six. All right, six in 16 minutes. Let me do 12 minutes, shall we? Diffiderm. The first one is diffiderm, and there's uh, one, two, two, three, start. hi, there's O'Connor Global Sources launch. Now, this is Elodi, and they make a little skin device that you rub it on your hand, and it'll tell you how much moisture there is in your hand. Okay. All right, now we understand ladies, that's important, but uh, gentlemen, it's also important that you look after your skin as well. All right, and so this, uh, they did a lot of de design development in Taiwan and they had a partner with China to do manufacturing, but the ch partner in China wanted the, the, originally they had the factory in Taiwan, but they wanted to move the factory from, uh, Taiwan to China and what they decided was uh, no because we can't secure our product IP if it is made in China and so what they ended up doing is they actually moved their production to Thailand okay all right now remember I'm not here to rubbish China I'm just showing you uh, I'm just giving you real examples of strategic decisions that real businesses are making to protect their IP. Okay, next, number two. All right, so the first way of protecting your IP from these startups and is moving to a country where you have a greater trust in the IP protection. Okay, all right. It may cost you more in other ways, but that's a strategic decision. Number two. Okay, remember, these are all startups here, okay? So startups don't have the luxury of Apple, 
which has 700 engineers in China to monitor everything and everything like that. Okay, go to check. My friend Matthew. Been like this, and this was on uh, Kickstarter. You raised Indiegogo so, first. Indiegogo, thirty thousand yep. k. Yes, that's right. Uh, US dollar. Yes. And then, what have you done after that? In so funding. Then after that, I uh, shipped the product in September, so it's fully shipped out and everything. How many backers? Uh, we have two hundred something backers. Two hundred. Wow. So raised on Indiegogo, then he raised money on Kickstarter. Still going well. How did he protect his IP? He protected his IP because he already had a leather goods business and a factory in Dongguan, China. He owned the factory. So he was able to get the suppliers to send the battery. Remember, there's a battery inside that, that case and he got the battery supplier to send the battery to the factory and then he secretly put that into his own product and then shipped it internationally himself. Okay, so number one, how do you protect your IP? You move to a country you trust. Number two, you own the factory yourself, okay? It, just like what Mike Bellamy was doing, having the black box factory, okay? So that's the product there. Number three, what else can you do? Well, you do what Grom does. What does Grom do? Grom does 3D printing. What does it do? Well, Grom does 3D printing of... Um, I'm not going to show you my legs here. All right. <laughs> 3D printing of your feet. So when you go to a podiatrist, that is a foot doctor, that is a doctor that looks at your feet to look at the bone structure. If you've got something wrong with your feet, then you might have to have special walking shoes to keep the bone structure stable and everything like that over the long term. 1 billion people in the world have foot ailments. So Grom actually do the 3D printing. Where do they do the 3D printing? In China. How do they protect their IP? How, how do you think they protect their IP? Hello. I'm talking too much tonight. Apologies. Hi, hello. How do they do it? Come on, how do you think they do it? Um, patent. Well, you can have a patent, but I just want you to think, out of those one billion people, maybe, you know, Grom, the product, they make the foot inner sole that goes inside your shoe. Don't you? Um, there's no uh, one pair of feet alike in the world. Every, every person's, each of our feet are all different just like a fingerprint. So therefore, there's, you cannot copy. All right, so what happens is, you know, Grom, what Grom does is they have agreements with podiatrists all around the world. A podiatrist, they measure the foot electronically. Grom has a special instrument that calibrates the arcs in the foot and things like that. And then that electronic imprint is sent to Grom. They send it to China and it's 3D printed and then it's delivered back to the podiatrist, cleaned up and delivered. Okay, but because no two feet are exactly the same, then there's nothing to copy. You see? So, um, so customized product is another way to protect your IP. Okay, number three. Remember, move to Thailand, own the factory, customize the product. What about iDummy? Well, iDummy is a is a, a a startup that came out of Polytechnic University and another company in China. Behind the scenes of the garment industry, dummies always perform a vital function as part of prototyping, manufacturing, and the fitting process. For a very long time. So iDummy, they came up with this ingenious design where you can actually computerize, calibrate the actual size of the dummy, you know, the, the, the chest, the stomach, the arms, the neck, you know, you make it wider, you make it bigger to fit any size clothes that you want to display in the shop. And so they designed this at Polytechnic University. Uh, in partnership with WinSim, and WinSim is 
a factory in China and the wind sim makes swimsuits. And so you can see the, the connection between the two. And so the reason they were able to protect their IP is they had a joint venture with WinSim in China. And so through that joint venture, ownership equity, that's how they protected their IP. So let's work that out again. Let's summarize uh, that again. Uh, number one, you can move to a country you trust. You can, number two, you actually own the factory in China. Number three, you have customized product. Number four, if you don't own a product factory in China, have a joint venture or have a ownership share of equity of the factory in China. So if someone copies the product, that factory has an equity share, they lose too. So it's kind of creating incentive that way. So there's four different ways. I've just dis described how startups are protecting their IP. Number five, and we're nearly done here. Uh, Julian Lee, Kickstarter. Oh, this is- Julian Lee, hi Julian. Hey. Finally, got to meet you. Wonderful Ambilabs, they've been around. You know, the, you know the brand, but here's the product. Julian, briefly, what does the product do? Okay, so what this product does is, you can actually put this in your room, and then you get your iPhone, your phone out, and actually that product can, communicates with your phone. And then it tells you the humidity, the temperature, and everything of that room. So it's a way of detecting the environment uh, in that room. And that may be important if you're not at home and you want to keep a certain uh, temperature, etc. Okay. And so there's, um, how did they protect their IP? Well, they did it in a stage production. Number one, they did their first own design in-house. 100 units by hand in Hong Kong. So, you know, they trusted Hong Kong SAR for this production. Then number two, once they realized that those 100 units are in demand and through uh, testing with consumer groups and focus groups, then they went to a 500 units. So they went to a factory in China. And remember what I said earlier, one thing is to protect your IP, and this is what Mike Bellamy also said, if you want to protect your IP, you need to control the tooling. You need to own the tooling because if the supplier owns the tooling, that means they could actually move it to another factory and make things without you knowing. Because they own it, that means they can do whatever they want with it. You need to own the tooling. But another way is start with cheaper tooling. That is, the supplier... Cheaper tooling means that the tooling or the mold runs out after you have done 2,000 or 3,000 copies, right? Then it becomes useless after that. So it's very hard for the supplier to go and make thousands and thousands of copies of your product because the tooling will not be the same, all right? So that's what they did on the second brand. And then that's where he went and met uh, Where did that John end up Bunford. now? That uh, well, that so we decided not to go forward with the production, right? Because uh, so with consumer products, uh, you have to take on a lot of risk, right. potentially. So you have to invest in the tooling. Mm. Uh, you have to invest in supporting the customers, mm. and also with just when you move into retail, right. there's also exposure there potentially. I remember last. Year. All right. So what happened was that. Um, Ju uh, Julian went to John. Remember, this connections people. Connections. He went to John and said, "John, uh, you know, you're involved with your factory network in China. Can you introduce me to a factory that you can trust?" And so then, with John's advice, they moved to a bigger factory. Oh, well, actually, John's advice, they went to the first factory, Apparatus. Sorry. But after that, then they get more consulting. They actually got a consultant involved to actually move to a bigger factory. And that's where they wanted to uh, get serious professional expertise to decide which factory they moved to. So in short, what happened with Ambi Climate is they went own design, uh, a cheap tooling to a factory for a small group of units. And then they got consulting professional consulting advice to actually find the bigger factory so and then finally let's have a look at rotorex a drone racer how how did they protect 
their IP because their IP was not necessarily in the engine of the drones, they were making the engines, but it was also the propellers. The propellers were really special for the drones that they were making. So they made racing drones, by the way. Um, oh, not playing. And so what happened was that another fact, the factory that were making the propellers for Rotorex, they actually shared the designs with other factories and they ended up making copies of the propellers and they ended up turning up on other drones and Rotorex found out about that and then started shaming that factory in the drone community. And so the buyers of other drones contacted the factory and what happened was it stopped the Chinese factory from sharing their product IP on the propellers. So that was the first example that I have ever witnessed of community shaming that, that came from the distribution channels and went back up the supply chain and actually communicated to the factories that, you know, this is not the right thing to do. Wow, you know, shaming from the competitors, that is the competitors saying, well, you know, we want to compete properly and we shouldn't be having this uh, copied propeller. Wow. So there are examples and tech packer, that's not necessarily how to get past IP and they're more enablers, but I just want to summarize here what they were doing. Okay. Number one, you could go to Taiwan. Number two, you can own a factory in China. You can actually join venture for a factory in China. You should, you could actually do a, a stage production from uh, a small sample in Hong Kong, then go to soft touring and then go to a major factory. So you do a stage so you don't make big mistakes. So these are different ways that startups are actually managing this IP problem. And not one of these startups told me that, oh, their best way of protecting themselves from IP theft is through a good contract. Let me repeat, not one of these startups told me that their best ways of protecting themselves from IP theft was having a good contract. Okay. And so I've just given you six. We've had 12 from two other groups. Let's just summarize here. Thailand factory, own the factory, customize blueprints, equity share, ambi climate, startup community, Rotorex, community shaming. All right, these other two are more enablers, that is their middle people like marketplaces. They bring other things to the platform of startups. But the first six, together with the six from Adyar's group and six from, there was another group that presented tonight, right? You had 18 startups tonight and a lot of what they talked about was their problem in managing the factory. A lot, some of them had distribution problems, but many of them had communication problems. Okay, uh, group one, the startups that you talked about, just summarizing here, Summarizing here, the startups that you talked about, GoKey, Javish, Bagel, AirButton, Brook, uh, Blocks, NanoLeaf, you know, a lot of it was, a, a, apart from damage on the molding equipment, but there was complexity, there was communication problems, there were production delays. A lot of these could be avoided through doing what Ambi Climate did, that is making sure that you do things in a staged fashion and making sure that you get the right advice from the community and then through consultants that you're working with the right factory. Ah, but the problem that a lot of these startups had that some of your groups talked about tonight, you, Jim, Chick, uh, Sound Bremer, uh, Atto Cube, Wi-Fi Electronics, all of these, you know, uh, the problem, the challenges that a lot of these startups had because they raised money on Kickstarter, Indiegogo, all of them were under pressure to make the product and deliver by a certain date. And 
if we look at we look at number one, Diffidum, that took time for them to work out their Thailand factory. Number two, Goti Check, that took time. Like the factory is already established. That took time. Grom, okay, that took time. I dummy, that took time for them to develop a relationship with the equity owner. And be climate, that took time to do things in a staged process. Rotorex, okay, being known in the community, that takes time. But have a look at the first 12 that were presented tonight, all right, uh, in the two groups tonight. What was the big problem they're facing that none of you groups mentioned? They are under time pressure. They are under time pressure to deliver a product. So that's the last thing you want to have on your back if you want to manage your supply chain properly. And I think that's a big thing you want to take away tonight. The last six that I just presented were successful ways that uh, manufacturing were, were controlled and managed, all right? Starting with the IP protection, but of course, everything else flows from that. Okay, so I just want to finish with that. And we've got to finish with our Kahoot. We've got one last question. So many of you have a chance. One last question. Are you ready for our last question? Okay, let's go. Uh, Jimbei Hala, are you ready? Yes. Okay, yeah. let's go. All right, Nicole, can you do it? Or Zoe, or Han, or it's me. Let's go. What was special about Royal Corp? Single answer. Owner mindset. I, I mentioned it so many times, didn't I? Okay, so let's have a look. The podium. Okay, congratulations, Nicole. Where's Nicole? Put your hand up. Okay. Okay. Zoe, where's Zoe? Put your hand up. Okay. Congratulations. And Agya, congratulations. Haley and Han, where are you? Hands up. Okay. Well done. Great effort. Great effort. Okay. This, this was challenging tonight. Number one, you didn't know that I was going to do this, but I just want to try it a different way. And I paid for the professional version of Kahoot so we could use those multiple responses. So it gives you a little bit more uh, leeway in uh, what we're going to do. And also I just want you to start getting into the mindset of reminding you about what we've been covering from week one, two, three, four, five, six, because the quiz after the midterm break will be covering, there's a few questions from each week. Okay. All right. Just to remind you on that. Remember, and uh, you know, there's at least 15 questions of the quiz that are similar to the multiple choice questions in the uh, Udemy, Udemy course. Okay. So, and you know, the videos that I've been showing you for particular, you don't have to watch every video in the Udemy, but um, that will give you an idea of what the multiple choice questions are about. Okay. Um, okay, so that finishes tonight. Uh, I did a lot of talking tonight, apologies. Uh, but we, I guess there's a lot to go through. And I think it's very special that uh, we, uh, you know, big theme. We can learn a lot from startups about the mistakes that startups make. And the two, present, two groups present tonight, great effort. Uh, you told us a lot about the errors that they made and what we can learn from those errors. Uh, can you all go and give your feedback uh, on the big thing that you've taken home tonight and the big questions on your mind? Appreciate if you can fill that in now, please. And I'm happy to take any questions.
Uh, while you're filling that out, I'm just going to stop the share here. Um, we put that down. Um, I like the Kahoot tonight. It's the first time I've used Kahoot. So forgive me if it's a bit slow or whatever. Okay. Uh, one, two, three, group. Okay, student feedback. I'm just watching it now. Um, and if you can just appreciate your feedback. Do you know what to do with the feedback? If you go into Moodle, you've got the... So I can't assess uh, the form. Oh, it doesn't. You cannot. Maybe uh, can others log assess? I can't. Oh, let me check. Oh. Um, does it ask you to ask for ask um, for a permission? No, it only says um, it's only available for people within your organizations. Oh, oh is that is everyone else have that problem? Anyone else? Agya, are you okay with that? Zihan. What about you, Hayley? Nicole? No, oh, I'm filling in right now. Oh, okay, all right. Okay, so while you're doing that, so, you know, my job is not to fill you with head knowledge, but I just want to see, uh, next week is the start of a two-week break, is that right? Yes. Okay, so um, I'm happy to, in one of those weeks, I'm happy to run another night session if you want to. Have, put your hand up if you like that. Yeah, we are fine. And, and during that session, I can do uh, a part, another, we, I can do another review of the first six weeks. Okay, so we just, just so you start to appreciate the whole theme of the unit so happy to do that and but also what i was seeing was having two parts that is if we run a, another night session and then half of it will be partly a review for the multiple choice quiz and half of it will be i want to talk to you about your job opportunities and and uh, getting ready for job opportunities especially okay some Many of you, you already got a job, no problem. Some of you are taking this course so you can ch broaden your horizons. Some of you haven't got a job and then you're going to be looking for one. Uh, you know, you're in different stages. But I want to talk to you about that and talk. Give, I want to give you strategies. Strategies that can re really work for your job uh, prospects, okay? So do you, th you think that'll be valuable if we do half and half on that? What do you think? Definitely, sir. Okay. Yeah. All right. And so if we run this uh, next Tuesday night, then it will be voluntary. Okay. That means you don't have to come. All right. So it's up to you if you come or not. All right. All right. So uh, what do you think of that? Or do you prefer that you run it on the 29th? Uh, Nick, let's run it next Tuesday night. What do you think? Yeah, Tuesday is fine. Yes, I think next Tuesday is fine. Yeah, all right. I think we can do that. I think that'll be good. Uh, I, I'm excited about that. And and also, we can also talk about your major projects too. Because I'm starting to talk with some groups about major projects. And... Um, my view, my thinking of the major project is always uh, focus on the tables, focus on the table, tabulating 
your curiosity about what you are studying with your major project. And if I um, ask all of you, uh, watch the video on how to do the project. Did some of you watch that video? What you'll find when you watch that video, I'll take you through the 10, 11 pages that you need to complete. And the big theme of that video is focus on, okay, uh, I want a table on page two. I want a table on page four. And focus on filling out the tables. And then you write the English after that. Okay, because the tables become your evidence. They become your representation of contrasts or things that you want to demonstrate in your project. Mm. So I have a question regarding the video presentation for our field work. My group is doing local field work. Yep. Um, is the video presentation live, like what we did? previously or it's pre-recorded uh, like we submit it as a video uh, it's pre-recorded okay you submit it as a video all right and the time limit is how much 15 minutes if i'm not mistaken exactly so it mustn't go it, it cannot go for 15 minutes and one second <laughs> okay, okay. It's, fif it's 15 minutes and you will submit that. And then I'm going to sit down one day or two days and then watch them all. Okay. And I did that for the first time last semester for the FinTech unit. And I found, yeah, it is much, much easier to compare and contrast and, uh, and give feedback. So it's good. Any other questions? That's a very good question. Energy is very critical, Haley. <clears throat> energy, energy is critical. Okay, just calm down here. All right, just, it's, it's very important to have the energy uh, when you're presenting. So when, when you're in a video, use your hands. Uh, be excited about your project because you chose the project. I didn't ask you to do a certain project. You chose it. So I assume that you're excited about it because you, you know, so um, that, that should come out in your presentation. So very, very critical. And it will be, be expecting it to be a little bit, it's got to be smoother. You may have to make, you may have to do two or three video presentations, uh, rehearsals to get it right. So that's do it better. Do it again, again, and again. So it's good. It's all fun. Um, good question. Uh, next question. Uh, thank you for your feedback and Actually, it's good now. We've got a heap of questions for each of the last three weeks. So I can make a video that can uh, summarize these questions and, and feedback. Thank you. Okay. All right. We did something. We didn't have breakout groups tonight. We did a Kahoot and said we'd try something different. And um, I'm always innovating. I'm, I've never, this is the first time I've ever done this. So we just tried something different. All right. So, uh, if you've got any more questions, you can ask them in uh, Google Hangouts and any group that needs to see me about their major project, uh, email me, uh, happy to meet on most afternoons. We just set up a Zoom call and we just talk through things. Okay, save your time, remember? Okay, don't try and... Uh, and the other thing too, with the major project, it's... Um, it's about eating an elephant. Don't think you have to know everything at the start. And what's important is to, you do a little bit of research at the start, you get some ideas, 
and then maybe you come back to me and say, oh, this is what we've got. What do you think? And how can we go further or something like that? And then sometimes I might be more valuable to you when you've got something to show me. Um, I, I present to me over Zoom, okay? I'm not necessarily going to look at something you write down, but if you present to me over Zoom, I can give you some feedback. Okay, wish you have a lovely night. Thank you so much for your feedback and we try something different every week. Let's, uh, uh, let's set a time for next Tuesday night, same sure. time. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And we'll, uh, a bit of revision. And I want to talk about a few things in terms of job opportunity or getting yourself improving your readiness. And, oh, by the way, uh, we all need, we all need to improve, including myself. It's always, there's, well, we're, we're like factories. Okay. If we're not working on maintaining ourselves, we deteriorate. All right. So me too, me too. Okay. So I'm always, so I want to share with you some secret sauce that I use to uh, keep my mind maintained in terms of the knowledge and things like that. So uh, happy to share that with you. And we do some, uh, okay. So see you next Tuesday at seven o'clock. Okay. Yeah. Is that good. All right. All okay. right. So we'll, all right. Good. Okay. Be good. Stay healthy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great night. Thank you.